Hi, my name is Karen, and I teach in the Linguistics Department. I also run our English for Academic Success program, uh, where international students can take some uh, gen ed courses and some additional courses to help them with their English development while they're students here at the University of Utah. Um, and in the Linguistics Department, I work with the TESOL certification program for students who want to teach English uh, in other countries or here to adults. Um, in the linguistics department, we study not just language, um, but how the brain creates language. So my area of expertise is second language acquisition, um, whether they're learning English or learning another language. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about cross-cultural communication. And the truth is this would be more aptly titled something like, why don't people act like me? Okay. Um, I spend a lot of my life wondering what's wrong with people and why they don't act like me. And if you're like me and that thought sometimes comes in, um, especially with students, like why don't they understand that they should be doing it this way that I've told them, um, then this presentation might give you a little insight into that. So first of all, we know that everybody's different, right? That's um, if I were to ask you if you're the same as someone else or if you guys are different, um, then we could come up with differences pretty easily. So everyone is different, and even though we know everyone is different, uh, we still expect that people are not going to be different. We still expect that they're going to act like me. So here's a communication example. Um, my husband and I are driving home from a party or something, and I say, hey, um, do you want to stop and get some ice cream? And he says, hmm, no, I don't really feel like ice cream tonight. And so we drive home. And when we get home, he's very confused uh, because I'm kind of angry that we didn't stop and get ice cream. Now, my husband's confused because the question I asked was about him. Do you want to stop and get some ice cream? But what I really meant was, I'd like to get some ice cream, but as a woman, I've been conditioned to ask things in a very polite, um, kind of uh, subversive way um, to try to get you to do what I want without me uh, looking like I'm demanding something. Okay, so we have these two cultural kind of influences that come into play that causes this miscommunication. And so even though I know that my husband and I are very, very different, I am angry because I'm surprised that when I ask for ice cream, he didn't understand my polite request as a polite request that I wanted to stop and get ice cream. So um, when I say that we're all different, okay? I'm gonna say this a couple of times. We know we're all different, but uh, we're surprised that we're all different, okay? So where do our differences come from? Well, we're gonna look at this picture. You're gonna have a really tough time reading uh, on the presentation, reading the things that are here, but this is what we call a cultural iceberg. So if you're familiar with icebergs, um, icebergs have a small portion of ice that's above the water, but the largest mass is below the water. And that's the way it is with culture, too. So when we get to know people who are from different cultures, uh, often they don't look like us or talk like us or, or like the same foods we do. The things that we see about them very easily are in this upper section of what we call surface culture. So on my list here, it says food, flags, festivals, fashion, holidays, music, dance, games, language, arts, crafts, literature, all those things are part of the surface culture. So the surface culture that we see. But what we can't see is the deep culture. And everyone has this deep culture. And it's how your culture has influenced you in things like communication styles um, and how you might communicate one with another. Uh, if I were to ask you, um, I'm sure all of you are very proficient English speakers because you're teaching at a university in English, I assume. Um, so if I were to ask you, how many seconds does one wait in English before answering a question, right? You're proficient English speakers, so you should know the answer to this question. Yet many of us don't actually know the answer to this question because when we learned English, we learned English in a way that we didn't learn all of the rules and specificities for it. Um, so the answer, by the way, is two to three seconds. How do I know this? Well, because when I watch classrooms, uh, if the students don't answer within two to three seconds, the instructor either rephrases the question or answers the question themselves. So not giving students a lot of processing time um, and the teacher responds or has to fill in that silence, okay? You can test me on that one. Now, other cultures have pause times after questions as long as 10 seconds. 
meaning that someone who interacts from my culture with two to three seconds with a culture that has 10 second pausing, the person who has 10 second pausing is never going to get to answer any question in the discussion um, because we never wait long enough for them to have a chance to answer according to their cultural rules. And again, it's not a rule that somebody's told them, it's just a rule that they've learned as they grew up in their culture. Okay? So things like uh, facial expressions are part of communication. Uh, how much is personal space, right? You might have had this issue with some of your students that some of them stand too close or too far. Um, that is also a cultural um, conditioning piece, okay? Whether or not we make eye contact. Uh, in the U.S. American culture where I grew up, making eye contact is often a sign that we are honest, um, that we're confident. Um, but in lots of other cultures, making eye contact is rude. And so in order to show respect for the person who has a higher status than you, you're not supposed to look them directly in the eyes. You're supposed to look away from them. So imagine the conflicts that occur in a job interview when someone looks away to show respect and the interviewer from, this, from my culture says, wow, Wow, they must be lying to these questions that I'm asking. Okay? It also includes things like concepts of time, whether we're on time or not, um, roles of family, roles of class, okay? notion of courtesy and manners, uh, what it looks like to be polite. Okay? Um, plagiarism can fall under this in that different cultures have different notions of what plagiarism or textual borrowing means and different notions of what cheating means. Okay. Also, attitude toward uh, elders, adolescents, um, maybe work or cooperation versus competition. Uh, those things all come up in our, in our cultural upbringing. Okay. We often don't talk about them, um, meaning nobody teaches that to me, right? My mom doesn't sit me down and say, okay, now I want to go over um, some of these things about how we feel about elders in our society. Uh, we don't ever talk about that, but I see from how my parents behave or from how other people behave, I see how it is that we value or don't value elders, and I often follow that same uh, pattern. Okay. Now there are some things where we have some direct teaching going on. Uh, in my house, we weren't allowed to have our elbows on the table, um, so I have been stabbed with a fork. Um, to be reminded as a child to get my elbows off the table um, and thumped with a, a heavy end of a knife um, sometimes to be reminded of that. So that's a way of explicit teaching, but most teaching about our culture comes from implicit uh, teaching. We're just watching and figuring it out for ourselves and our brains. Okay? So let me review a couple of things. One is most of culture we cannot see. So it exists, but we don't see it Okay? But we can have conflicts over it. Okay? And most of culture is not taught to us in explicit rules, but instead we learn just by observation, which means that it's not, it's not in an area of our brain where we can talk about it very easily. Right? I can give you some communication examples because I teach language and work with language all the time. Okay. So back to our where did our differences come from? Well, they came from our upbringing, right? The place in the world where we grew up or maybe uh, our parents, right? We can grow up in a place but have a little bit different culture from the place we live in. How do we know when we are different from someone else? Mm, well, I know when I encounter the differences, right? So um, my husband and I, we've only been married for about five years, and um, I did not know before we were married that his mother had taught him uh, the wrong way to use a tube of toothpaste, right? I was unaware of that fact until I encountered the difference. In fact, I didn't even think that anyone used the toothpaste the wrong way. And, and I'm talking about, you know, the way that you either squish it down to the end or maybe you roll it up. Um, I've learned now that there are actually several different ways that people use toothpaste, right? And of course I'm kidding, I've known that for a long time, okay? So the question really is, why are we surprised when someone is different? So we know someone's different, we know their upbringing was different, especially if they come from another culture. Why are we surprised when they're different from us? Okay. One interesting thing that often happens with international students is I hear people at universities, not just our university, but at universities say things like, wow, we really want some diversity. We really want to diversify the types of students we have. 
what they actually mean is they want the students to look very different in terms of their physical appearance, but we want them to behave the same. We don't actually want the diversity that comes uh, from some of their cultures. Sometimes we're like, oh, that's a little too diverse. I'm not sure I want that. And I didn't know that people could be that different. Okay, but the truth is we know people are different from one another, so uh, we shouldn't be surprised when they're in fact different from one another. Okay? So I want to talk to you about a couple of words. Um, so on the left side here I have ethnocentric, and on the right side I have ethnorelative. I like to talk about these two terms as a continuum. Okay? Um, and depending on the situation, I can lie anywhere on this continuum. So an ethnorelative person is a person who accepts um, lots of different ideas, lots of different ways. Um, and it's actually harder to talk about ethnorelative. It's a lot easier to talk about ethnocentric. So an ethnocentric person is someone who, say, uh, only has one correct way to squeeze the toothpaste out of a tube of toothpaste. Okay? We joke around a lot at my house. Um, that I used to, okay, I have, I have moved on to the ethno-relative version, um, I used to believe that there was only one correct way to load the dishwasher. Okay? And so I had struggles sometimes as my children were loading the dishwasher because it wasn't correct. Okay? That's a very ethnocentric point of view, the idea that my way is the only right way. Okay? An ethno-relative perspective is something like, wow, there are many different ways one can load a dishwasher. And surprisingly, most of them even work. Okay? So there's not only one right way to get the dishes clean. Who knew? Okay? Now, when we're talking about this in terms of culture, um, Milton Bennett proposed um, a scale of intercultural sensitivity, okay? with the idea that when we encounter something that's different, okay, when we encounter something that's different, we react in either an ethnocentric way based on ourselves or an ethnorelative way, which is based on many experiences. Okay? Let me give you an example of this. So um, I am a true red-blooded American who really, really, really likes my peanut butter. And when I go to a foreign country, many times I cannot find peanut butter. And I know that there are lots of alternatives, um, but it's not the same as my peanut butter. And so when I first get there, um, well, often before these stages, there's a honeymoon stage where we're very, very excited to be there. Um, but after a while, I start to get angry. And anger occurs somewhere in this area. Okay? And I start to get angry at this new place that sadly has not discovered the joys of peanut butter. Um, or if they have, it's very, very expensive. Okay? Um, but sometimes I can move out of that ethnocentric area, feeling like, well, one can't have a polite society without peanut butter. Um, sometimes I can move out of that area into acceptance or adaptation as I start to find some other solutions to my peanut butter woes. Right? So I might try some new foods and I decide, wow, actually I even like this more than peanut butter. I'm not missing peanut butter quite so much. Okay? So again, when I start in the ethnocentric stages, I start with something like defense and denial and I'm a little bit angry. But over time, I can actually start to move down here to the ethno-relative stages uh, where I'm not feeling quite so angry and in fact I might find some really great things about my new place. Okay, that might even replace the thing I thought was so great. Okay, let's see if I can think of another cultural example. Hmm. An ethnocentric way to view the world might be to say something like, wow, in my country we have democracy, and I think democracy is the best. Okay? In fact, I think democracy is so good that I think every country should have democracy. Okay. Um, that tends to be down here on one of the ethnocentric stages. And I know I've just picked kind of a, a politically charged uh, uh, question there, but I think it's a good example. Because some people care so much about democracy and sharing it that they actually become violent in this area as they try to spread their, their great vision of democracy. 
right? An ethno-relative perspective might be something like, I'm going to give you two stages, okay? An ethno-relative perspective might be something like, wow, I really love democracy. I'm so glad that I live in a democracy. However, I can see that there are some other places that are very comfortable with something that is not democracy. And they're very comfortable with that. So that's very interesting. Okay. As I move further down the ethno-relative stage, I might even say, wow, I used to love democracy, it was my favorite, but now I can see that there are these other perspectives on the world, and they all seem equally valid. Okay. Now, in fact, I'm going to be a little bit honest with you that I'm not sure I quite get to that equally valid on all other forms of government that go on in our world, but I definitely am at a point where I can see where other people are happy with different forms of democracy or different forms of government that don't look like mine, okay? And we can go back and forth on this continuum depending on the topic, okay? So here are some examples of cultural values um, that might come into play in your classroom, okay? So the difference between individualism and collectivism. Okay. Um, individualism, my culture, says that the individual is the most important. Collectivism says the reverse, that society is the most important. Uh, you likely have students who are majoring in your courses or in your major uh, because they have been told by their parents that that is the right thing to do for their family. Okay. That is not what happens in an individualistic society, but in a collectivist society that's very common and it puts a certain kind of stress on students that we don't see from domestic students, right? Domestic students have different stresses. Okay. Direct versus indirect. Um, we have some cultures that are very direct and they might ask you a question in the form of a command. So um, Indian English is an example of this. I often have students send me a message that says, you need to, and it's actually their polite way of asking a question. Okay. But when I read it, I think it's a command and I start to get defensive because that's not the way to communicate with a professor in my culture. Okay, formality versus informality. Um, some students are going to be very uncomfortable coming to talk to you because in their culture they might need an intermediary to talk to their professor because you're of such high status and they don't have the informalities we have here in the United States. Okay, or they might feel uncomfortable asking you a question because in their culture they've learned that um, if you ask a question of a professor, that it means the professor did not do a good enough job and they don't want to insult you in that way. Okay? Um, egalitarianism, high, low, uncertainty avoidance, okay? these are all things that we can um, encounter as we work with people who are different from us. Okay? Some of us can handle um, some ambiguity as we're going through information. Some of us, our brains can't. Okay. So whose responsibility is it to make the communication successful? Is it the student's responsibility or the professor's responsibility or is it both people's responsibility? Okay. Well, shocker, um, in the humanities I'm of the opinion that both people are responsible for this communication. Right? It's a two-way street. So both parties are responsible to make the communication successful. Okay? And this scale of intercultural sensitivity sometimes gives us some cues, some emotional cues that help us understand what it is that's happened in the situation. Okay? So here's what happens. This is our, our communication incident. Okay? I expect people to behave like me, ethnocentric, okay? but they don't. And then I react with anger, fear, worry, something, right? Imagine the dishwasher scenario, right? I expect that everyone's gonna load the dishwasher the same way I do, but when I open the dishwasher and discover they didn't, I might get angry. Kids, why didn't you load the dishwasher correct? And then the kids get really upset, but I did what you told me and our communication breaks down. Okay, so when I get into the anger stage, that often puts them in a defensive stage, okay? Um, now, we can recognize these feelings and emotions um, and recognize, in fact, that it's not the situation um, that is the, really the problem or the other person's belief may not be the problem. Maybe some of it is my belief, right? Maybe I need to understand that there are multiple ways to load a dishwasher. 
Okay. If I recognize my harsh reaction is one of those defensive mechanisms in the ethnocentric stages, um, then I can, I can think about that and say, actually, I want to try to be more ethno-relative. And then we learn um, something more about ourselves and something more about the other culture. Sometimes we have to ask questions, right? If we're talking politics or religion or plagiarism and cheating, lying, all of those types of things that differ from culture to culture, in order to understand, um, in order to understand why we're not on the same page, I might actually have to ask some questions to understand where they're coming from um, to see if our expectations are the same, okay? Or the place we're coming from is the same. So in order to have communication success, um, one of the ethno-relative things is to expect others to behave like themselves. Not to behave like me, but to behave like themselves. Um, we recognize when we have that negative defensive reaction, often anger um, is my first clue, but fear also may play a role. Um, when we recognize our negative reaction, we learn more information, right? We get more information, and then we continue communication and building the relationship. Okay, so um, if I were to call a student in for plagiarism and we have a little chat about what does citations or cheating look like in their culture, okay, you might find out that in some cultures the way to be respectful because everyone knows who the experts are is to use their words exactly. Okay, to use their words exactly because who am I to try to say that in a better way than they said it. Okay? And as you talk with your students and try to understand what it is that we expect versus what they expect or believe, um, then we can kind of come to an understanding to help them understand what the U.S. Uh, education system is expecting them to do. Okay? Um, here are a couple of references um, from this presentation, but I'm always happy to share more information um, about ways that you can improve your communication in that way. In this presentation, but I'm always happy to share.